Since we've learned that reducing or restricting carbohydrate intake can play a role in improving your metabolic health and even helping people lose weight, we've had no shortage of people going through this process of time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, lowering their carbohydrate intake, and experiencing all of the wonderful benefits as far as how it makes you feel as well as how it makes you look. But also, people have been doing this in order to reverse diabetes or prediabetes, and it's pretty powerful even from a brain health standpoint since we've now, over the last decade, have learned that Alzheimer's disease or dementia, it can be considered a kind of type 3 diabetes. So our understanding of blood sugar control has dramatically improved in the general public, and we've been looking at tons and tons of blood work on people who have been making pretty dramatic changes to their diet and lifestyle. And here's what we've learned. Most people who go through this process of low carbohydrate, paleo style eating with time restriction will certainly have their hemoglobin A1C, which is their long-term proxy for blood sugar. That number will actually go down for most people. And then there are those who actually have their HbA1c go up or not change at all with an incredible amount of frustration. So I'd like to explain why you might do all the things you're supposed to do and have that HbA1c go up. So let's first of all talk about what HbA1c is. Hemoglobin A1c. So hemoglobin is the protein found in a red blood cell and that protein is made from iron and that protein has different positions on it that sugar can get stuck to. So the A1c position is where sugar kind of gets stuck on that and renders that red blood cell essentially useless. It can't do its job, which is to deliver oxygen. So what we find is that there is a certain acceptable amount of percentage of red blood cells that have the sugar attached to it, and that is typically 4.8 to 5.2%. And then we consider 5.3% to be elevated. 5.3 to 5.6 is certainly elevated HbA1c or a percentage of cells that are rendered useless by a sugar being attached to it. And then once you get to 5.3%, 5.7 all the way up to 6.4%, then you're classified as being pre-diabetic. And then when you're above 6.4, you're considered diabetic. And diabetes is a horrible disease. It destroys blood vessels. Sugar is very tightly regulated in your blood. You can't have too little and you can't have too much. If there's more than a teaspoon of sugar in your blood at any given time, 90 minutes after a meal, then that moves you towards pre-diabetes and diabetes. Matter of fact, a teaspoon is perfect, but a teaspoon and a half is essentially full-blown diabetes. And a half a teaspoon might actually put you into a coma. So blood sugar is really tightly regulated, kind of like your body temperature is. And when we have excessive sugar in our system, then those sugars start to attach to the A1C position of the hemoglobin protein in your red blood cells, and we can track that over time. Now, red blood cells do not have mitochondria, which are the engines of energy production that all of our cells have, except for red blood cells. And because of that, they don't live very long. So a red blood cell in our textbooks are supposed to live 120 days. But what we find is that they actually live 90 days in modern American lifestyle. And therefore, we say that HbA1c is a three-month running average of what your daily exposure to glucose is. And we use that as a way to track people who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, especially if they're being treated. We can watch their HbA1c come down if their treatment is being effective. Now, HbA1c is also being used by people who are not diabetic or pre-diabetic. So if your A1C is, let's say, 5.5, you're not considered medically pre-diabetic, but you're considered in the beginning stages of insulin resistance because it's not optimal. 4.8 to 5.2 is optimal. So with that being said, if you want your blood sugar to go down so that you release less insulin or you become more insulin sensitive, well, then that can contribute to you releasing more fat from your body fat stores to be used for energy, which can help you lose fat and lose weight without losing muscle. Like this is all part of that whole keto-friendly lifestyle or ketogenic diet, what people are trying to do to mobilize fat as a fuel source. And this is all very good. It's, it's a very healthy thing to try and do. We get frustrated when we get our blood work done and the HbA1c actually went up or it didn't go down at all. And, and we want to know why that's the case. So usually the lifestyle changes that people make, again, there's dirty keto, <laughs> There's kind of like, you know, just dramatically increasing your fat, lowering your carbohydrate, and not really making yourself healthier, like eating keto versions of all the junk food. That's not a good idea. But if you go on a paleo style, real food diet, and you increase your protein and fat intake and limit your carbohydrates to more fibrous type of vegetables and use extra virgin olive oil as a way to increase your percentage of fat exposure, you can start the process of using a different energy source and mobilizing your own fat. And you can measure that 
that improved insulin sensitivity by seeing the HbA1c come down. But when you do that and you are healthier, well, then you're more likely to make your red blood cells actually live longer than they were before. So instead of a 90 day, they might start migrating towards 120 days. And if the residence time, the amount of time your red blood cells are available to float around in your bloodstream, they're going to have more exposure to glucose. Now you can eat no glucose or no carbohydrates. You always have glucose. Your liver is always pumping out glucose. Always, right? If it didn't, you'd have type 1 diabetes and you wouldn't be living very long. So with that being said, the improved health of your red blood cells and increased resonance time can cause this A1C to kind of increase a little bit. Now there are other factors. There's, you know, sometimes when we go on a low carbohydrate diet, the body's like, whoa, where's all my carbs? You know, and you'll release more cortisol, a stress hormone that causes you to produce more glucose out of your liver. And that can happen for a period of time, but usually that temporary, that's usually just in a couple of weeks that your cortisol can be elevated because of low blood sugar. But if you continue with the process, that normalizes or it should normalize unless you're under a tremendous amount of stress at the same time. So there are other factors involved, but this longer residence time of your healthier red blood cells can be a wonderful explanation for the elevated HbA1c and that therefore a reason to not be discouraged. Now, over time, that A1c should come down. So don't let that discourage you. Don't think your blood sugar got worse just because you had your blood checked and your HbA1c went up. Hopefully that was helpful and gave you a little understanding of this hemoglobin A1c marker and demystify it a little bit.